not support the glaze or decoration without first firing. The decoration methods as demonstrated in the Long Chen dioramas are engraving, incising, pressing, carving, and painting. In earlier ceramic periods, decoration was under the glaze. It was in the later Ming and Qing that overglazed decoration was mastered and used in Dozai and Wuzai enamel decoration that required an additional firing. So it was only in the 15th century that there was overglaze enamel. And those of you that attended Rosemary Scott's uh, lecture last year, it was specific to overglaze enamels. We'll then have a glossy surface, corrosion resistant and strong. In ancient times, people glazed biscuits several times before firing to thicken the glaze gradually and make the glaze look more translucent like jade. After the glaze has dried, the ceramic is fired again at the appropriate temperature for the clay type. There are many kiln types, and what you see here are, is really a composite of different kilns. And if you can't see them, we can look at this a bit later, the, the different kiln types. This particular um, illustration on the right are the most commonly used kiln types in China. The dragon kiln was used in Longchen, where celadon imitating jade was produced. In some cases, the prepared ceramics were placed in containers called kiln furniture, or sagars, according to their size, and put in the kiln. The big ones were placed in the middle of the kiln and the small ones at both side ends. Since the temperature is higher and stable in the middle, which is much easier for making large wares, and the temperature is lower at both ends, so the small wares were fired there. Generally, the temperature in kiln was kept between 1200 and 1300 degrees Celsius. The final glaze depends on the cooling method, composition of gases in the kiln and their density. Once ceramics were fired, sorted, and inspected, they were packed and shipped to the client by river or other forms of transport. Some were transported by river to ports and packed on boats. Others were transported overland. Imperfect ceramics were usually broken and that's why archeologists are now able to study the kiln sites from shirts that they find. You guys are organizing a field, a, a study in Phnom Penh. Are they working on a particular site? Uh, yes, yeah, we are. We are joining a few students and we join a real excavation at Jump Up site. Like uh, there also contains some ceramic cubes uh, dating back to the seventh century. It was quite a That's quite interesting. So in Cambodia, Cambodia, yeah. they are oh. working on a kiln site from seventh century. Yes. Are they glazed or unglazed? Uh, I don't know. Don't know, yeah. <laughs> yeah It'd be interesting that. for you to tell us when you come back oh, yes. what you see, <laughs> yeah. So now we move on to a little bit a more general subject, is why are Chinese ceramics important? For many scholars, Chinese ceramics are the first and most abundant evidence of Chinese culture and art. Ceramics do not degrade as easily as other organic materials. So they are historical facts, physical facts, that document the course of history. Chinese ceramics are also evidence of trade and have influenced taste around the world. Chinese ceramics are historically important because of what we have learned from their discovery. Historians have studied the Qin Terracotta Army in Xi'an for information about the Warring States period. The discovery of the Belatong shipwreck confirmed that there was direct trade between China and the Arab world by sea in the 9th century. This Tom plate on the lower right with the incised foliate motif is unique to the shipwreck collection. <coughs> the blue and white collection at the Top Copy Museum in Istanbul is a datable collection of the volume, quality, and type of ceramics exported 
from China to the Black Sea during the Yuan Dynasty. Trade. Ceramics are a primary source of information about trade. During the Song Dynasty, ceramics became a major commodity and since then, porcelain has almost constantly been one of China's most important exports. So if we know where a type of ceramic was made and the approximate date that it was made, and if an archaeological investigation unearths that type of ceramic in a datable site, we then know how far that ceramic has tra traveled and if it traveled soon after being made or much later. So, for example, Chong, Song Qingbai wares, porcelain, have been found excavated in, Europe, in, in Egypt. And Song covered boxes have been found in tombs in Southeast Asia, Japan, and Korea. In the Yuan Dynasty, production of export ceramics grew rapidly and played an important role in trade. Only silk can be said to match the long history, physical quality, craftsmanship, and multifarious roles of ceramics. Internationally, the influence of Chinese porcelain on the material cultures of, un of other nations is unrivaled. Ceramics influence both Chinese and Western taste. From the Song Dynasty onwards, porcelain was collected by emperors, men of learning, and the well-to-do. The sector of society who considered themselves arbiters of taste, the literati group, even wrote treatises on taste featuring Song ceramics. By the time of the Ming Dynasty, enough Chinese ceramics had been exported to Europe to create a desire for and appreciation for objects from the Orient. Chinese ceramics were featured as valuable and tasteful in these three 15th and 16th centuries that feature blue and white ceramics. Can you all see from the back? Yeah. What makes Chinese ceramics valuable? Everyone is interested in how, thing, how valuable things are. For ceramics, as with all art forms, prices are what the market will bear. In the case of ceramics, the best indicator of price are recent sales at auction. The four criteria to look at are source, <coughs> provenance, quality, and rarity. Source. When and where was the object made? If the place of manufacture and the approximate date of manufacture is known, the value of a ceramic can be estimated by comparing sales of similar pieces. Provenance. Who has owned it since it was made? The more complete evidence in the chain of ownership, the better. With the most important ceramics, there will be documentation of who owned the piece prior to sale and in many cases, records of several owners and sale history. So if you remember at the beginning, I talked about the most important Yuan piece, the Fontil vase, which is really the only piece of Chinese ceramic in Europe and other than the Imperial Collection where a complete provenance is known. And that's what makes it so uh, important. Quality. Some pieces are better than others, just <coughs> the same as paintings. An outstanding Picasso commands a premium over a poor example of his work. It's the same for ceramics. A Jing De Zhen piece made and stamped with the mark and reign of an emperor will always be more valuable than, common, than a common piece, even from the same kiln. Rarity. A unique piece will be more valuable than a piece that was mass produced. Case in point is the Rue Ware washer from a Japanese collection that was sold recently at auction. There are less than 80 known pieces of Rue Ware in the world and few are in private hands, and we mentioned this earlier. Compare the real Rue with a Rue type ceramic. Although the Rue type is valuable, it was sold for less than 100 times the value of the Rue washer. Do you guys remember reading about this Rue washer that was sold? It was on the front page of the Straits Times. And the estimate was 600,000 to 800,000 Hong Kong. And it was sold for 1.2 million. To give you an example of how sought after it was. 
and compare that with an almost identical glazed piece that is a, a rude type washer and its estimate was 60,000. It was sold for 200,000. Which one is the rue type? The rue type is the one on the left. The, the oval bowl. And the rue washer that came from the Japanese collection that had the provenance and was part of imperial wear on the right was for 12 million. So the difference between 200,000 and one point, or not 12, 1.2 million. Is the rule type also from the Song period? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a rule type. Rule type. How are Chinese ceramics appreciated? The Song Dynasty text on connoisseurship has stood the test of time and remains a relevant text till today for the appreciation of ceramics. And that's how Sir Percival David created his collection. He was a Chinese scholar. He studied classical Chinese. He bought the original text and studied them and then collected based on what he learned. And that's how the Percival David collection came to be that's at the British Museum now. And I would say that's the finest collection outside of China of imperial ceramics. The Ming and Qing scholars studied and imitated the Song literati tradition. And those of you at ACM that did the docent training have studied the literati tradition. And even at SAM, when you study Chinese painting, people often reference the literati tradition. But it takes a long time to actually understand what they're talking about. So it's sort of an ongoing process that even I continue to read with great interest about. This painting shows the Qianlong Emperor appreciating the paintings in his collection. Note the ceramics on the table next to him. And I've put the entire painting and then a close-up of the ceramics on the table. He was a scholar, a collector, and in a way, a museum goer, albeit to his own collection. So another way of appreciating is a historian or a scholar. Historians and scholars use ceramics to study a culture, a period of time, or in relation to another object. Ceramics are tools for research. How do we know about the Qin Emperor and the people who lived during his reign? By looking and studying his ceramic army. In China, there are annual conferences where scholars present their research and new findings. The images here are of a ceramic study conference in Longchen near Hangzhou in Zhejiang province that Johannes and Mr. Ho attended. And you might see yourselves in that picture, maybe one of them. And this year, the Ceramic Society is going with our member, Lin Ya Chu, to the same annual ceramics conference at the end of October. So there'll be a small group of us going. And if any of you are very keen, then please let us know. And we would quickly ask Ya Chu if he can add your name. So I think at least five or six of us are going, maybe more. So it'd be nice to have a larger group. And you can also appreciate ceramics as a collector. An accomplished select collector has three traits. Financial capability, persistence in searching, and a discerning eye. We have one notable collector in our midst who values his ceramics among other, above all things. And if you're very kind, he might show them to you. Photographs on his iPad. Johannes, I'm identifying you. Um, a collector does not have to be incredibly wealthy, just have the ability to buy objects for his particular collection. He or she may choose to collect a type of common object or objects from a certain period of time. I know someone who has collected transfer wear ceramics all over the world. The collector must be patient and wait for objects that complement his collection to come on the market for him to buy. The collector would want to study everything about his objects and train his or her eye to spot distinguishing features. The best way to do this is, in the case of ceramics, to handle as many as possible. Here are examples of what might be part of a collection with a yellow theme, a single cup, and a pair of bowls. And I would say that 
studying the catalogs that we have available for you all to take home at the back of the room is another way to begin deciding what you like and what you would like to collect and to look at the price points and the reserves for the objects that you might be interested in buying. The last way to appreciate would be as a museum goer. Look where the ceramics were made and where they were found or came from. Look at their purpose. Why were they made? For export or for use in China? Look at the material. Is it earthenware, stoneware, or porcelain? And how were they decorated? Unglazed, painted, incised, glazed, decorated, over, under the glaze, or both? Ask yourself if the ceramics were made in China or were they made to imitate ceramics from China? as in the case of the ceramics that you're going to excavate in Cambodia. And lastly, ask yourself what you like about the piece or why you don't like it. Your opinion, your thoughts, and how you've enjoyed your visit to the museum is really all that matters. I was talking to a friend in the States before a holiday and told him I was overwhelmed at having invited a crowd and was cooking so many dishes on my own. He laughed and said, remember to enjoy yourself as you're doing this. And it was a good advice. So whenever you are studying or looking at a piece of ceramic or going to a museum, remember to ask yourself, what am I enjoying about this process? And, and remember that. So this is our outline for an hour today. I know it's been fast and furious. And I'd like you to take home an understanding of the when and why ceramics were made why they are decorated in the way they are, and appreciation for shape and color. Thank you for coming this evening. Do you have any questions or anything you'd like to add? Yes. What makes uh, Ru Yao Ru Yao and Ru type? Ru type? What's the difference? Ru Yao is a very specific kind of clay and a very specific kind of glaze. And when you compare it, the rue crackling is very, very fine. And it will usually have a, it will have um, a mark and rain on the bottom. It will be marked and it will have come from the Imperial Collection. So they are still looking for the Rue kill. They haven't yet identified it. They think that they're close because they found shards, but they haven't actually identified the kill. And the rue type wares would be Guan, um, Misa, the secret wear that they think is in Famansi, and the go ware that they are excavating in Long Chun would also be Ru type. Alvin, do you have anything to add to that? I'm no, I'm no expert really, but uh, <coughs> we had the privilege of um, visiting the Chang Foundation in Taiwan. And um, we spent more than an hour just having shots. And uh, the lady who gave us the lecture was really absolutely very professional. She showed us uh, X-rays of the molecular structures of Yao as well as real types and so on. And this is really quite different, right? Uh, the, the, the molecular structures of the Yao are a little bit more dense, where the others are a little bit more dispersed. And so we had the privilege of handling Wu uh, which is itself. So I would say that besides uh, uh, um, really looking at these um, complete types, um, in order for you to understand and, and really learn about ceramics, you need to handle. Right? The more you handle, the, the more you learn. And shards is one way of handling it. And so for the society, um, we do have training sessions and, and sometimes um, some of our members become shots. So do come, right? Um, Really, you can't. There's, there's, there's no such thing as a as an instant learning. It takes decades for our collectors to learn. For me, I started off um, with this.
catalogs. In 1994, a friend of mine gave me a catalog. He said, hey, Alvin, you know. <laughs> and it was all main pieces. And from there, I was fascinated. And then along the way, I, I got calm, really. I started out with straight shamans where all the time I was. And I was, uh, uh, I made a full law of, you know, <laughs> in ceramic wood, uh, uh, straight shamans, but not, not good quality. So uh, the learning process really is to handle the the other way of handling it is really true. You'll be surprised when you go for options. They actually allow you to handle <laughs> it. It's just amazing. They allow you to touch it. You know? And in this case, there's like 40,000, 50,000. And they say, yeah, I see it. They have it. <laughs> they let you handle it. It's quite scary. Yeah, so that's one way. You can just dress like in it and they allow you to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'd like to touch that. Or you can, you can go and do a course at SOAS. So it's very unlikely that you will have an opportunity to handle a rue chart or a rue piece. I think if you had gone to the, the preview for this auction of the Japanese piece, they would have let you handle it. And in the, the ceramics course that I did at SOAS, there's a teaching collection and there is a very large rue piece that was broken and then repaired and it was donated to the university for the teaching collection. So when you, Alvin is absolutely right, when you touch it and you feel it and you feel what the glaze feels like and you feel how heavy it is, then when you pick up another piece beside it, it's quite obvious. But it's only, I think, like you said, from touching hundreds of pieces and the fellow from the Chang Foundation said, after 30 years, I can pick up a piece and I know from touching it. And if I'm in doubt, I put water in it and then I smell it. <laughs> that was one of his ways after so many years of handling ceramics to really understand and know whether he was touching the real thing or not.
to have things in blue color. Then in Yuan, they started to create it, and there was such a demand for it in the Middle East that it became mainstream export wear. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then in Ming, of course, it was for export. So do you know if there was a... Do you know where it originated? Was it the Middle East that had the blue and white? And therefore... Yes. The, uh, and then it came to China? Yes, because there was a great deal of exchange. And so the cobalt that was used for the original blue color, the source of that color was the Middle East. So it had to have come from the Middle East to China to be applied to the, to the white ceramic. And then it was going to be re-exported back. So it was Middle Eastern taste on Chinese ware. But the Middle East had a taste, had the desire for the ceramics from China. So it would be kind of like, I love the color purple, but I can't get a purple dress here. So I place an order to a factory somewhere for the purple dress and then it's brought back to me. So there was a great deal of exchange, not only of raw materials, but technology and taste. And we really only confirmed that interest in blue color in the Tang Dynasty with the Bellatone Wreck. Okay, thank yeah. you. Not um, <coughs> um, the earliest in blue and white really early wrecks are painted with this, this, this cobalt, which is from the Middle East. So if you want to go to the museums in the Middle East, you will see early wrecks painted with the, these are the so called blue and white, but they are not possible. They are early It is China which produced earliest blue and white as evidenced by the one found in the Belgian red. So that's the earliest um, possible form. But in terms of aesthetic taste, blue and white was very introduced, but as urban reds. So um, for those who are docents with the ACM, you will see, if you go to the library, you will have to have uh, this thick volume by the Gino Crawl. And it's on the collection of the Tokaku Museum. So you'll find a few pieces there. But I don't think I work for you, go and do your own research. Good job. Yeah, it's the Tokaku Museum. So, but this, this um, um, research was done by the Regina Cross. Book, at least two or three volumes. But only the ACM can say it's in the library. <laughs> not even the National Library can say it. Uh, so, not even the National Library. So, go and I'm sure Regina Crawl. Regina Crawl. A R A H L. You have a very good library at the ACM, so maybe you should. I don't think they have books in there. Are they going out now? No, they don't have books in there. Okay. I have another question. Yeah. When they try to uh, date a piece, the rain mark could be. Um, Deceiving, right? Yes. So, how does one really date a piece? By knowing the clay, glaze, style of painting, and method of design from a particular design? area. I will give you a very good case in point, my own personal experience. I went to an auction in Stockholm and there was a blue and white bowl that had a dragon painted on it and it had a mark and rain on it and I thought okay fine this is the estimate low bid I went off I placed a written bid I came back and I got this I found that I had been successful in buying that bowl so I brought it back and I brought it to our show and tell and I had Johannes and Lumiachu look at it, and they looked at it and they said, look at how this dragon is painted, and look at the shape, and look at the foot. And yes, it says that it's this rain, but it's not really. It's like 200 years later, 
and they were copying that style and they put the market rate because in the first market, in that first period, the emperor didn't allow his market.